Welcome, baseball fans, to this edition of State of MLB. Well, we are a week into spring training, too, or summer training, as you may call it. And we are a week and a half away from the beginning of the baseball season. It's an exciting time, and there's a lot of development going on. I'm still formulating my uh, new power rankings for the short season. There's a lot of elements I want to take into consideration, and we'll get into that in the next video or two. Uh, especially as the season begins on the 23rd, 24th, the beginning is played, time to rank, right? So, getting into things for this week, the uh, right after last week's video, they published the first test results. They've complained since then that results have been slow to get back after you got that baseline testing going on there. Uh, the company that was contracted to do it said they could deliver it overnight and there have been reports that that overnight has been delayed in some cases. Either way, there are still continuing tests, still continuing to monitor. But the very first test, the baseline for what we are with the uh, infections for cross major league baseball, not just players but staff and personnel, is 3,185 tests were conducted as a baseline. Out of that, Three, over 3,000 people, 38 came back positive. That comes down to a 1.2% infection rate across the entire league, staff and otherwise. Of that, the breakdown comes down to 19 out of 30 clubs had one or more people test positive. While the number of 38 is certainly an area of concern, if you consider the fact that it's one, it's a hair over 1% of everybody, that is a lot better than people expect it to be, and it's definitely a lot more manageable. Those 38 people, whether they're high-profile names, like Freeman from the Atlanta Braves, or low-profile people that you may not be aware of, like Joe Ross, uh, they get to go home and sit through quarantine and wait till they test positive twice in a row before they can resume activities. Unless you're Freeman who decides to opt out altogether, we'll get into that. In the meantime, you still have 98.8% of players still available to play. They're negative of the, t of, the, of the virus and are able to put on a show for the fans, which is a beautiful thing. So that's a good baseline to understand, and as managers and GMs have commented on this, that you know, if we can maintain that level and or reduce it, then we're in good shape for the season. It's where you don't want to see this explode, and we'll get into that in a minute because we do have a they do have a plan B. Granted, it's a bit of a weak plan B, but considering their protocols in place. We're hoping we don't have to go there, but we'll get into that, okay? Now, some of the elements re related to this infection is the fact that it uh, delayed the season by three months, and that in and of itself has some ripple effects with players, okay? Players who were on the injured list, who were recovered from injuries, Tommy John surgeries, calf injuries, back injuries, arm injuries, whatever it was, had three extra months to get ready for the season and to heal up. That allows a lot of players to come back and start in July at full strength. You've got teams across the board who have or are going to be able to start players that previously would have been on the starting on the injured list. So that will help those clubs start at full strength. And I don't think there were too many players who got injured in the course of staying in good shape and staying up to speed because I mean, at that point, you're not straining yourself. You're just trying to get healthy. You're trying to stay in shape. You're trying to exercise and work out. You're doing all the things you're supposed to be doing to keep healthy and to get healthy. So getting injured in the course of that will be oxymoronic. <laughs> so along those lines, we do have some players because of the fear of this condition, of this uh, pandemic, who have opted out. And in opting out, they've also that to not take a salary for the year. So. If Buster Posey, you have, uh, some of the big names, there are, there are a number of players who have opted out, over a dozen of them, but some of the big names, some brand names you are, may be aware of, Buster Posey of San Francisco, Freddie Freeman of Atlanta Braves, and the David Price, formerly of the Boston Red Sox, now the LA Dodgers, have all opted out. 
taking no salary for the year, but wanted to be safe with their, uh, regarding their families. Freeman, of the three, is the only one who actually tested positive, so Price and Posey are opting out despite being negative. Um, now, Freeman being positive, opting out, means that he gets a full salary for the season because he's already got the infection, He wouldn't, and if he didn't opt out, he wouldn't be able to play anyway. Whereas Posey and Price, they were, are healthy, they could play, they do not get a salary for opting out. Those are personal family decisions, and I respect that. Having big names like this does suck for the game because you have high caliber talent, whether they're on the back end of their career or not, still not available to play the game, still not available to put on a show for the fans. Sucks for the fans, but we respect the decisions to do what's best for the family. Having said that, you have players like Mike Trout, who is one of the most renowned names in the game, who just had a newborn and is playing anyway. So take it for however you want to take that regarding their decisions to opt out for their family reasons. I completely would understand players who want to opt out because they're concerned about risks to newborn, fa newborn children, to their wives, to at-risk family members, whatever. I completely understand that. I respect that 100%. I've been largely working from home because my wife is being compromised and I can't, don't want to risk bringing that to her, let alone my baby. So I completely understand that desire. At the same time, you also have players who are in the same circumstances and are still playing anyway. So, that's a personal decision they have to make. You can weigh in on your opinion as to whether they're doing the right thing or what. It's, you know, from my perspective, I respect their decisions and it is what it is. You know, I'm not going to try and give them a hard time for not playing what others are because they have reasons for what they're doing and they're not taking a salary. Freeman being uh, one of those players who are eligible for the salary because they tested positive and are high risk, you know, he's got to do what he's got to do. He's got to take care of somebody, he's got to get healthy, he's got to get himself free of this, uh, the infection. I wish him and his family all the best with that. So, getting to the plan B. Um, they have a thousand page novel of safety protocols between social distancing, cleaning, testing, everything else. And according to all the various medical experts they've discussed about this, they feel confident that this should protect the, the, them by and large from getting the infection. However, if they do find an infection flare up somewhere, essentially they've got two options. Plan B would be to change the stadiums. Let's say, for example, New York City or LA got flooded with infections and a spark uprise. They have stadiums that are within range, but outside of the city, that could move the Mets and Yankees to and have them play in college stadiums and what have you. Same thing for the Angels and, and, and the Dodgers. They could move them out of Anaheim in LA and play them, like in, for example, in, in Vegas or something like that, where they're outside of the city limits where the infections are ramping up and keep them in a safe zone, perimeter from where the infections spurred up. That is certainly a viable option. It's going to be weird to play in a non-major league baseball club. At the same time, you're also starting off the season with empty stadiums anyway. So it's not like you're asking fans to go out of their way to travel to you. You're playing in an empty field. So given that, you can move the players. You can move the film crew. You can move all that virtually anywhere. Set up shop and, get, and play a game. Sure, on camera, you're not going to see the traditional field. I get that. And it's weird. <laughs> but you're also going to have a, an unusual situation where in Iowa you're going to have the Cardinals and White Sox playing a game. Neither one are playing Bush Stadium or uh, Chicago's field. I think it's progressive. I keep track of that. But um, baseball names, you know, basic stadium names. But they're, they're playing with playing in Iowa. Now, granted, it's to, it's to recreate the Field of Dream Stadium. I totally get that. I think that's going to be awesome. On a regular basis, if you have a, a team playing in a on your team. It's just something you adapt to, you deal with, and you enjoy the game for a while of this. So with all that laid out for the uh, the results of player situations 
And in a very worst case scenario, if changing stadiums doesn't work, then their alternative would be to shut down. And fundamentally, that would show an absolute failure of a thousand page protocol to keep everybody safe. So I haven't read every page of this thing to tell you what I think of it. And I'm also not a medical expert to tell you if, if it makes sense or not from a scientific standpoint. I'm going to rely on the experts who they've hired and paid good money to to provide all this information and pray that they uh, keep safe and have a wonderful season and get to enjoy a championship and all the fans get to enjoy that as well. So, moving right along to some fun stuff. Now that we've been talking so much about the pandemic and player reactions and league situations and all the back and forth over the last couple of months with the negotiations, let's get into some fun stuff. Let's get into some baseball stuff, okay? Now, there are some givens on p teams with which we think are going to take their division by landslide. Yeah, the LA Dodgers uh, are powerhouses. The New York Yankees are powerhouses. Minnesota did phenomenal last year. You've got up and rising Atlanta. Um, Houston lost some players, but compared to the rest of the division, I, 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 don't, still, I don't see anybody else really being a s serious threat because you lost Garrett Cole to the Yankees, but you still have the rest of the rotation and finally, that's still a very strong rotation. You've got Zach Greinke. You've got a, a lot of other players uh, to step up. You still have your lineup. I mean, you lost one pitcher. You can you can build around that. So I still feel, feel Houston is a threat in the West. However, having said that, we do have a, I've picked out a few teams that I felt would be sleepers, and let's go into them, shall we? The Cincinnati Reds, I have long hoped for, have a rebound. They have, they did have that one playoff round where they got swept by the Philadelphia Phillies and that, and that notorious Roy Holiday perfect game. However, outside of that, the Cincinnati Reds have not been relevant for a very long time. I still remember the, while I wasn't alive <laughs> to watch the games, I do remember reading about them, watching the, the playback of the games of the big red machine that swept the Yankees back in the 70s. So it was a beautiful thing when you had a powerful team with Johnny Bench and company in, the, in, in Cincinnati. And I would, and when Ken Griffey Jr. moved to the Reds, they were hoping to turn that into the next version of the big red machine. It just never really materialized much because you need to have a well-rounded team, not just one megastar. So, Texas learned that with Alex Rodriguez. However, in a give, give, based upon what happened last year with Cincinnati, with their bullpen being taxed, having the uh, pitchers hit who weren't very good at batting, and having getting beat up by the whole league as a whole, this situation with a short season provides a very unique uh, arrangement for Cincinnati, which could enable them to become a sleeper team that makes the playoffs out of the blue. Those circumstances are the fact that you have a universal DH. You now have a person hired specifically for hitting who can theoretically slug, now hitting for the pitcher. That deepens and empowers your lineup. Plus, with a shortened season with only 60 games, you don't have to fill as many innings with the bullpen. Therefore, you can potentially keep them fresher, keep them longer, keep them stronger. On top of which, with the season the way it's set up, they're going to be playing the AL Central and playing a handful of games against the Kansas City Royals and Detroit Tigers, with which American League teams who are in the cellar of the league that gives Cincinnati a prime opportunity to uh, beat up some of some bad teams and pad their win-loss record and help them get into the playoffs. Granted, they are across interleague games. You only get three or four, but you get a, out of a 60-game season, close to 10, uh, one sixth of your season against teams that are in the gutter of their division. So we'll see what happens there, but I have Cincinnati Reds having an opt a golden opportunity to seize the day, caught by DM, ride these advantages to their favor that are unique to them over many other teams and use that to get them into the playoff hunt. Another team I find a sleeper is while I thought Chicago White Sox reload of Keuchel and Carnacion and company was a phenomenal move by Chicago which showed a lot of faith in trying to make a championship contender out of the Chicago White Sox, it, I, I'm cautiously optimistic for them. I'll be rooting for them to make playoffs. I'll be rooting for them to make the, this AL Central competitive and very interesting. 
At the same time, a move like this reminds me of when the Toronto Blue Jays made a massive seven-player tra trade with Miami and other clubs to bring in a whole bunch of players, um, who some of, most of which are no longer in the league anymore. Um, but they brought in all these players, and these big brand-name players made the Toronto Blue Jays look like the new powerhouse. And then you throw them into a season against Boston, New York, and Tampa, and it, yes, they were competitive. They did challenge for the division, and... But they never, and they and they made the playoffs, but they didn't go deep. They they fundamentally did not have the depth to, and the team chemistry. That's important. I well, I mean, you bring a lot of superstars. They have to play well together. They have to complement each other. I mean, sure. In in nineteen seventy eight, you brought in Reggie Jackson to the New York Yankees, and he had big, uh, with um both Thurman Munson and, um, Billy. I'm, I'm sure I will remember the last name, Martin, Brian Martin, uh, <laughs> uh, back in the 1978, and there was a big clash of the whole Brock is burning thing going on with the power outages and the type of stamina and all that jazz. Um, you ha you can bring in players and despite conflict still succeed, but that is an outlier. That's not common. In most cases, if you have a well-rounded team, but they don't pl have the chemistry, they're not going to perform on the field, they're not going to succeed. We'll see what happens in Chicago, but I'm cautiously optimistic because both the players can turn the team around, but if they don't mesh the way Toronto didn't mesh, it won't work out. It'll just be one of those pipe dream kind of things. So they're a sleeper. Uh, cautiously optimistic about them. The LA Angels being my third team in a sleeper because they've when they lost Socia as the manager, the team just spiraled downward. They didn't have the leadership, they didn't have the talent, they didn't have the elements in place to actually make a run of things to be competitive like the way like they were. Now you've got Joe Madden in here, a new skipper who has a proven track record at Tampa and Chicago Cubs. Hello World Series, 2006, I believe. Um seven. Uh I anyway. Plus you got Tani coming back on uh, going back into the switch role, pitching and hitting. He's healthy, and you have the protection for Mike Trout and Anthony Randone. You have some fundamental pieces to help the LA Angels be more competitive and challenge the Houston Astros for the division and potentially take the division and go deep. Do I ha think it's enough to challenge for the championship? No, I don't. But as a sleeper, they do have the potential to threaten the Astros for the division and make things interesting in the West, which fundamentally, if you have greater competition, it's better for the fans, it's better for the players, it makes things a whole lot more exciting. You don't want a team like the LA Dodgers just beating up on their whole division and running away with it. It's boring. It's great for the fans of the Dodgers, but for the league as a whole, it's boring. Granted, as a Yankees fan and as a Marlins fan, it kind of sucks to see a team go through being on the cellar constantly in the NL East, and you can't, you have no bragging rights ever with the Marlins, <laughs> and with the Yankees you constantly have uh, Boston in a, in a duel there, and and the Rays nipping at your at your heels, and you're always worried about when is Baltimore going to reload, when is Toronto going to reload, what are these newcomers going to do? The fact that you have that threat there keeps things interesting because now that you can go to sleep at night and be like, okay, we're, we're the best. We're just going to run away, run away with this. My Astros have had that benefit the last few years. Granted, they have a phenomenal team, yes, but now it's time for some parity. It's time for the, for the Angels and the, never, never mind the Seattle Mariners, but uh, for, for Texas as another, another option to step in there and, and give them a challenge. Let's see what we can do. So those are my three sleepers, Cincinnati, Chicago White Sox, and the LA Angels. Let me know what you think about what I think. Do you agree with this? Do you think other teams are real sleepers? Let us know what you think about all this. If you just happen to be coming across this video on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And I love bringing it all to you. Thank you again once again for watching. I'll talk to you next time.